So I'm G.T. Hill. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, G.T. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Hi. There we go. I know you guys got up early to uh, go to uh, Solar Winds this morning. That's what I heard. Excellent. Saw some uh, tweets from that. So I'd like to start off with some introductions of some ruckus people. In the back, we have Mr. Marcus Burton, who's going to stand up so you can see him. And Mr. Marcus Burton um, is a previous delegate, actually on the wireless side. He is uh, quite notable within the Wi-Fi industry, and we're uh, uh, pleased to have him work for Ruckus now. So uh, he's authored a few books and, and children. He has a few books <laughs> as well. And also Sandip Patel, who is uh, a really, really, really smart person. And I'll uh, say some nice things about him later. Uh, so he's he's going to hang out as well. So uh, again, I'm GT. I don't really have much of a title here at Ruckus, which is OK to say as long as Selena's not here. Um, I do work in marketing, but I, I came from the tech side. I just, so don't think less of me because I work in marketing is basically what I'm trying to say. Go over to the dark side. What's that? Went over to the dark side. Well, I like to hear myself talk. So that lends itself <laughs> well to uh, being in the marketing department. Um, so what I'd like to do to start with is if we could go around the room and tell us a little bit about yourselves. We, uh, of course, are the, the oil and the water here because we're the, the wireless company in the network field day, which has traditionally been wired. So we're going to uh, just go around the room and have any, everyone introduce themselves. And also, I want to hear uh, kind of what you do, but also some hobbies. Like, a, if you have an interesting hobby, I'd like to hear that as well. So, right. Terry, you're up. This was sick, twisted stuff. Okay, so I'm going to do route switch type stuff. Really, I haven't done a lot of wireless. Okay. Um, hobbies, sailing, and um, remote control airplanes. Nice. I do like that you said what a wireless experience you have, because if nobody knows anything, then I'm going to be golden today. It'd be much better for me. But good to have you. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Brandon Carroll, and I'm uh, a trainer. I've been a trainer for about 12 years. Route switch, wireless, security. I primarily focus on security now. I like long walks on the beach. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and pina coladas. And pina coladas, yeah. Okay. Uh, and are you uh, have a significant other? Uh, yeah, uh, sure do. Thousand people just sighed yeah. on, the, on the video screen. <laughs> <I know. laughs> All right, great, good to have you. Yes, sir. Uh, so I'm Tom Hollingsworth, and I'm glad to be back at Ruckus. Um, I'm a jack of all trades where I work, but my hobby is playing Batman at night, the vendor vigilante, <laughs> where I get to say mean things sometimes. But, it's okay. Uh, it's not about me personally. It, no, 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 I no. Complex. Got lots of love for GT. Thanks, <laughs> what about, oh, so that's your hobby? My hobby is blogging, which okay. is, yeah, I don't have a life. I write like a seventh grader, so I tend not to blog much. That's why we have Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yes, sir. Brent. Yeah, yeah. Brent Salisbury, uh, Twitter at Network Static, and a blog at Network Static. Okay. Those are your hobbies? Oh. All right, great. John? Uh, John Herbert. Um, Wife and three kids, so I have no hobbies. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> what would you be doing if you had time? Not a lot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do music and stuff occasionally. Okay. Yeah, I play keyboards and guitar and things. But uh, I'm mainly route switch, and uh, I use Wi-Fi rather than deploy it. All right. Great. Yes, sir. Paul Stewart. Um, I don't have a lot of wireless experience, but, but I do have some. Uh, I'm married. I've got a couple of kids. Um, this is a hobby, right? Okay. <laughs> now, I write like a seventh grader too, but it doesn't stop me. Uh, so, <laughs> I write at packetu.com. Okay. Ethan Banks, um, enterprise network guy mostly, and uh, uh, wireless experience. I've got a Cisco uh, enterprise network uh, with, or Cisco enterprise wireless with a wireless LAN controller for 2508 and a bunch of their clean air APs that are out there. Uh, distributed across all of our remote offices coming back into headquarters. So interested to hear what your deployment would look like okay. uh, in a competitive scenario. So okay. Hobbies, I, uh, I do this. <laughs> this? <laughs> Pretty much. Okay. This stuff, podcast, and so on. I used to teach classes for lettered agencies that are really smart lettered agencies. So I go around a room, their ho hobbies were like <laughs> robotics and chemical engineering and they didn't really like people, though, so there's, there's upsides and downsides. <laughs> John. Uh, John Longmike, I'm a network engineer, route switch. A um, little bit of wireless here and there when we have to. Um, 
but uh, hobbies, I'm studying for my CCIE, so that's it. That's all I do. So you have no hobbies anymore? anymore. Yeah. Uh, CCIE route switch, I take it. Yeah. Okay. I'm Josh O'Brien. Uh, I run an IT team now, but when I'm not doing that, I route switch data center. I used to help manage a WISP, so I, I've got some wireless in my background, but a little bit of everything in the past. That's how I started out, was a thousand miles in the middle of nowhere, Oregon, with no internet. We said, hey, let's solder some antennas together. And then that didn't work, so we bought some. <laughs> as far as hobbies, uh, family, but I like to hunt in the outdoors with my boys. So. Okay. Where are you from, actually? I'm from Ohio. Ohio, okay. I know good people from there. A few. Marcus Burton. <laughs> All right, good. Hi, I'm Greg Farrow. My current role is uh, working for the office of the CTO for Canopy Cloud. I'm the <coughs> network architect for their global cloud strategy. Uh, in the evenings, I also record a podcast with Ethan on packet pushes. I'm also a writer for Network Computing and for GigaOne Pro. I'm an analyst at GigaOne Pro. Uh, and when I'm not doing those things, I'm usually blogging on my own blog or uh, making smart comments on Twitter as at Ethereal Mind. That's smart with the English sense, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so you make me nervous because you're uh, there's some really smart people in here. So that makes me nervous. Say nice things. I'm sensitive. I'm a nice guy. Okay. I'm sweet. Thank you. <laughs> Not while I'm eating, man, please. <laughs> yes, sir? So my name is Colin McNamara. I run the cloud line business at uh, Nexus IS, also the chief cloud architect there. Uh, my blog at colinmcnamara.com. Uh, my chief hobbies are arguing with people on Twitter. Uh, making Joe John sick lately. Uh, <laughs> uh, in serious, uh, hobbies include cycling, uh, building M3 UAVs with my kids, and randomly blowing stuff up in my backyard. Um, let's see, wireless experience, started uh, shooting Wi-Fi links down grain silos to extend internet back in the you know, mid, mid, late 90s, um, to you know, experience in the Marine Corps with Wi-Fi shots, to, you know, it did to a lot of X stuff as it's emerged. So there's a, just a lot of really new interesting stuff that is really cool to learn about. Don't claim to be an expert with this. Okay. Grain silos and water towers are the savior for Wi-Fi. You, 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 outdoor Wi-Fi. It is great. The, the, the extra 80, 80, 100 plus feet is amazing. Yeah. Excellent. Pete? Pete CCIE, about Switch. Uh, just speaking at Craftsman, I'm with Terry. Uh, we both actually go quite, quite a ways back where uh, Terry led, I helped write the CLI on the Cisco Writers. Um, anyway. Uh, it's kind of well known now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think we stole it too, along with a bunch of other companies. <laughs> oh, there you go. So we do consulting on a whole bunch of uh, government customers. Um, I'm our data center practice lead, but I have wireless experience with the Cisco wireless in particular. Um, it seems like I keep trying to hand that on, and people either leave the company or it's very hard to find people that know wireless. So, Some of the best words said all day on so far. That's for sure. Well, it's a very, uh, it's it's also a very to sell a product because you can't get it deployed. So I did a uh, site survey for GAO uh, in DC that was uh, about a million square feet. And it worked with a, uh, a pilot for the treasury where they were trying to work on a uh, desk phone. So, spotting skills. Oh, that's great. So one of the things we wanted to start with today is really just making sure you knew who Ruckus was. So we are a Wi-Fi company. We actually had switches at one point. We're like, hey, we're probably not very good at that. So, so we are a Wi-Fi company that is in the, the, the mix with a lot of other really good companies out there. You'll find that Ruckus and myself especially are very objective people. If you say, hey, what do you think about Cisco? I'll tell you all the good things, and I'll, think, I'll tell you where I think we're better. Uh, my experience comes from Ruckus is my first real job. I was in the Air Force for six years got out in 99, and then after that, I was an independent contractor until Ruckus said, hey, you should come work for us. And I was a Wi-Fi guy. I, kinda, I was an MCSC, MCDBA, MCT, but I knew nothing about stuff, anything. So I did that all in the 90s because I lived in Washington State, and it's a requirement to live there. So, so I didn't know a technology very well, but I really latched on to Wi-Fi. And I just feel, uh, I, I felt compelled with Ruckus's story. And now my job basically is to turn around and tell that story. So we are a hardware manufacturer of Wi-Fi gear. Again, we did the switches for a little bit, but we're really, that's what we're, our core, core focus is. We're in the company of other uh, people like Aruba. Uh, a, a lot of other companies started with the goal of solving a Wi-Fi problem. The first Wi-Fi problem is security, right? Everybody, 
I was like, hey, Wi-Fi, it's something, but it's completely not secure, so don't do anything with it. Aruba and Maru, two of our competitors, started in 2002 to fix problems. Aruba was for security. Uh, Maru was actually for roaming. And those were problems that really existed at the time, and both of them are you know, successful companies today. Um, you have your, your, your Cisco's, HP's, and, and Mo Motorola's of the world where they have Wi-Fi as a, uh, an addition to their, most of the time, route and switch practice. And then there's the core of us that are kind of Wi-Fi only, again, Air, uh, Aruba, Maru. And then you have Arrowhive, which is a competitor of us down the street. Again, I love those guys, great people, uh, nothing bad to say. Uh, but they started, they looked at another problem with Wi-Fi, which was control plane and data plane. And they worked to solve that. Well, Ruckus in 2004 said, we see a problem with Wi-Fi, and that is performance. Wi-Fi is something that you can't trust. I think that if we were to, to, to boil down the problems with Wi-Fi to one word, it's trust. And that you can't trust it, you couldn't trust it from security, you couldn't trust it for performance. So we sought out to fix that, to fix the performance gap uh, in Wi-Fi. And what we work on specifically at Ruckus is kind of what you guys may take for granted in a lot of cases. Uh, Marcus and I were trying to come up with a theme, and, and I said, look, really, you guys, for the most part, trust your layer one, right? There are times when you need to change cable, change some glass out because something bad happened. But for the most part, if your network is working, you trust layer one. In <coughs> Wi-Fi, that's the most untrusted portion of Wi-Fi today, is the fact that the Fi just doesn't work right. It is, uh, again, spotty, coverage, density, speeds, performance in general just doesn't work. So, so that's what we work on. Uh, a gentleman like Sandip in the back, again, you'll hear from him later. That's his mission in life. He sits there at a desk and working on gear with the sole purpose of making it faster, more reliable, and more trustworthy. I, I think um, it's good to know where we came from. Right? Our roots actually started in trying to solve a video problem. Um, two guys, uh, Victor Strom and Bill Kish, got together uh, from Sequoia, uh, and they said, hey, let's solve a problem with Wi-Fi, which is getting video over Wi-Fi. And this was in 2000, early, like 2002, uh, before Ruckus was even a company. So these two guys got together, and they made some pretty fancy technology that in 2004 became a business called Video 54. So Video 54, back 54 megabits per second was the awesomeness. That, that that's where they started at. And, and so they built a product that we sold a bunch of. We actually, for, for I don't even know the statistics today, for a long time we bought more radios than any of our competitors, not Linksys, but we actually sold more chips than anybody because we were doing what's called the, you know, the, the CPE business. Um, in Asia and Europe, IP television was huge in early in the days before we even really did anything with it. They could get high-speed internet to their house, but then distributing within the home could not be done with wires cost-effectively. So we have these pair of products. We actually don't even display them much anymore because they look like napkin holders. They're these C-shaped napkin holder taco-looking things. And you would put one side on your cable box and the other side of the TV and the other side of the house, and it worked. And that's stuff we take for granted today. It's in a commercial for AT&T. But back then, it was no one could do that. So we had to work not only on the hardware, we had to work on the software piece as well. Quality, how do you deal with quality of service, prioritization? Um, so all of that mixed together to a really viable business. But then some really neat things happened, like um, Mr. Steve Jobs saying, hey look, this phone is the future and it's really cool. And then all of a sudden, a whole bunch of Wi-Fi devices hit the market. At about the same time, Ruckus started focusing on an enterprise business. We said, we can take this technology and we can compete against the Arubas and Meirus of the world. And we've done a pretty good job of that. We've, worked, we've been uh, quite fortunate as a company uh, to do well there. So, so that's a little bit of our history and, and, and to solve that performance problem. But how would you define Wi-Fi performance? Look, tell me, go ahead and tell me, how would you define, if you're going to compare or look at a device, you want to say, hey, is this access point that Ruckus has worth anything, or compare it to uh, Meraki or something? How do you test it? How do you know if it's any good? What's your criteria? Um, signal strength. Okay, just sheer signal strength, which right. equates to range as well. Right. <clears throat> more, and more and more nowadays, I mean, I think anyone can make a transceiver, and I think it, it, it's quite 
it requires manufacturing rigor to execute on that, but the real differentiator is integration into integration in the differentiated services I can provide, ease of management, UI, yeah. and the operational aspects of it. Okay. Yeah. So and, probably, and, uh, some RFID orchestration is obviously vital in the densities. There's more things in the pocket that are IP, so density is really good. I'll toss you a bit of a softball here. <laughs> now that everything is wireless, we have to compete with everybody using the same airspace. And so okay. not just coverage from, hey, I can cover this whole building, but my neighbors have APs, and I've got a test dev network that has its own wireless network. How can we all play nice so that everybody gets the best performance? Well, it depends on that. We're looking at a situation with a stock trade firm which wants to take a call center on Bluetooth headsets. They've already got Bluetooth keyboards, Bluetooth mice, and other devices, mm -hmm. and the level of Bluetooth signal may become a real problem. So, so I actually want to address something that Colin said. Colin said anybody can make a chipset, which I agree with. We actually buy our chipsets from the same company that Meraki and Arrowhide do, to Atheris, now owned by Qualcomm. But I'm actually going to say that, that that's one of the things I'm going to have Sandip talk about later is that you know, we can all get the same engine from the manufacturer, but there are things that can be done. And that's where, that's where I'm going to let him talk about that later. And what? I'm not discounting manufacturing. No, no, not at all. Right. But yeah. No, no, I, I'm not discounting what the, 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 the <clears throat> management and integration portion. You can have the best thing in the world, but if it doesn't fit on the road, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't make any sense. So, so a lot of the history of Wi-Fi testing started with single client. You, know, you would take your, your laptop and you connect it to an AP and you'd see how fast it could go. And you do it for me to you in a little lab. And that would say, yes, we're good, and no, someone else is bad. And that evolved to, okay, well, let's take that single client and see how far it can go. This is also the evolution of rockets. You know, let's see how far it can go. And then the real thing that, that starts with Wi-Fi is you start with multi-client. Then you're like, okay, well, let's see how many 10 can do, or 50, or 100, or crazy numbers like 200 devices connected to a radio today. And if someone would have asked me two years ago, I said it's ridiculous and we should never do it. Today we do it. Not because we're trying to be cool, but because our customers at Ruckus, our Ruckus customers want that. They're saying we need 200 people connected on a radio if you want us to buy your gear. Now, the next step in that phase of, uh, of Wi-Fi design and practices is how do you perform in a multi-AP environment? So multiple access points of your own is, is difficult. Now when you have your friendlies, now you mix your unfriendlies in there, right? Like Tom said, well, what happens when you have a bunch of people with access points? What if you're in downtown New York City? We got a bunch of gear in downtown New York City. It's arguably one of the worst Wi-Fi environments there is. How, how can you improve your product in such a terrible environment? And that's what we try to do. And, and that's, we have some technologies that, that we think have contributed to that. Uh, one of the things at Ruckus that we say quite often now is, if you want to know how good we are or bad we are, um, test us in a really difficult environment. What we say to our prospective customers, we say to you guys, is if you get your hands on Ruckus gear, do the test in multiple access points, pick the worst part of your room, the worst part of your corporate building, you hate it, it doesn't work right, put it in there and see how it tests, and then test us against someone else. It's a bit like test driving a Ferrari, right? If you test drive a Ferrari on 101 at 5 p.m., it's really fun to be in a Ferrari, but you're not going to see what it does. We need to be tested in stuff that's really bad. If you put Linksys, Cisco, Ruckus, Aruba on a table in a clean environment with me to you, me to Paul, and you test it, every one of us will get the same speeds within 5%, right? And that's including Linksys, right? Something you get from the, your favorite big box store. It's, it's in, you know, you put 100, AP, 100 clients on there in the middle of 100 APs that makes the real difference. So we can't talk quite about our technologies because one of the challenges, really one of the reasons I work at Ruckus is because there needs to be a bit of translation. And Ruckus, as opposed to uh, the Arubas and Arrowhives of the world, our story is actually harder to tell because you have to understand how Wi-Fi works to do it. I can't just say, look at our fancy products, and someone's like, oh, that makes total sense. It doesn't work that way. You have to actually see the intra workings of Wi-Fi. Then you're like, hey, now this makes more sense. So we're going to start with talking about Wi-Fi as a function. Some of you are really great with Wi-Fi. Some of you are newer to it. So just I apologize for starting where I am, but we're going to ramp up here pretty quickly. 
Number one, Wi-Fi is like a 200-port hub. Anybody ever use a 200-port hub? Really? They actually, I was actually joking. I thought they didn't exist. Yeah, still trying. So seriously, David says it's a chip. Really? Yeah. I need to see a picture of one of those things. That would be awesome. Play Network's 5000 BN. So, so, so imagine that 200 port. That was really cool, right? Because they actually did FIDI and token ring and ATM. But was that a, was that a switching hub? So you actually had two bridge domains. No, that were hubs. Okay. So imagine a 200 port hub, right? Just like you know about hubs, they're half duplex. Only one device can talk at a time. The problem even gets worse with Wi-Fi because one of the things that Ethernet can do that Wi-Fi can't is detect collisions. Right, Wi-Fi transmits, a collision is detected, it reacts to it in some way. Wi-Fi, when it transmits, it, can, it has no physical detection mechanism to detect that there was a collision. So what we have to do is we actually do a random number previous to transmission, we randomize numbers. To be technical about it, it's between zero to 15 typically. So if I say randomize between zero and 15, and I have all of you do that, there's 12 of you sitting at these tables, I have you do that, by the time we get about here, even halfway through, the chances of a duplicate are about 85%. It's ridiculous. What happens if two people pick the same number? You have a collision, things blow up, you start over again. So Wi-Fi by nature is actually anarchy. Uh, contrary to some popular belief, an access point is not actually in charge of the network. There is no way I could say, Marcus, talk. I can't say, you know, Terry, it's your turn. There, we don't really have those mechanisms in Wi-Fi. The access point has no control. It is true anarchy in the network. So the control of that, or, or trying to tame that network, can be pretty tough. Um, it is, it's difficult to do. So there's ways we can try to improve that. Um, one of them is this thing called data rates. Now data rates are something that if you just take a pure ethernet person, a wired person, you guys know 10, 100, gigabit, 10 gig E, or you're familiar with those. I actually, um, so I used to do a lot of hotels. Back when I was an independent contractor, I would do Wi-Fi for like the hotels, but not the nice ones. I would do like the cheap ones. <laughs> so a guy was building a new hotel next to his other one, and he had the foresight to say, look, I only want to pay for one T1. So by the way, this is way back when. So he's going to pay for one T1. He's going to run Ethernet from one hotel to the other. And he did that. He ran conduit. We fished the Ethernet, plugged it in. It didn't work. I checked my ends, you know, make sure I crimped everything right, didn't work. So then I realized very quickly, it was about 450 feet long. Oops. Uh, oops. So, I had learned a little trick to fix that. And that trick to fix that is I actually put a hub on one end, not in the middle. I put a hub on one end that was 10 megabits. So I put a 10 meg hub on one end, which lowered the speed of everything. And guess what? It started working. Because as you talk slower, you can handle less signal. If there's less signal, you can actually change. You, you know, if you want Ethernet to go 500 feet, it will. You just have to make it talk slowly. So Wi-Fi has this stepping system that works exactly the same way. That as you gain or decrease signal to noise ratio, so if you have some source of noise versus, or sorry, some source of a signal versus your noise, as you increase that differential, you get more speed. And again, in the wired world, this is not really the case. You crimp your ends right, you don't kink your cable, your glass is all intact, you get the speeds that were advertised, you know, whatever that may be. In Wi-Fi, this is, we have hun literally hundreds of different speeds. And in today's, we start at one megabit per second, and we go up to 450 megabits per second. And there are hundreds of, of gears in the between, if you think of it that way. And it's all based on signal strength, signal to noise ratio, this, this, this signal, how much you get. Now, the faster you talk, one important point to understand, if you take a 1500 byte frame, and as you talk at one, if you let's say you send this at one megabit per second. Marcus, what do we say that was? About 12, mic 12 milliseconds. Then it takes that frame about 12 milliseconds, not microseconds, but 12 milliseconds in the air. For that 12 milliseconds, and actually longer, because Wi-Fi 
um, doesn't have any error checking mechanism necessarily without, uh, it's a layer two error check, that that packet is in the air 12 milliseconds, which is an eternity in a Wi-Fi world. That if you increase the speed, let's say you increase that to our maximum of 450, that may get, say it up off the top of your head, you know? 25, 50, 20, let's say 25 microseconds that that will be in the air. So imagine that we have someone in the room that's from deep Georgia, right? My wife's from the South, so I can talk about the South this way. <laughs> right, you find someone from the South, they talk slower. It's not because they're bad or anything, they just talk slower. And I grew up in Oregon. I tend to talk fast, and then the Northeast is really fast. So if I could have you introduce yourself, and you're an auctioneer, we could have got through that thing in 60 seconds. Right? If you can talk like an auctioneer, then Brandon can go next and Tom can go next much faster. So when you talk about the performance of Wi-Fi, the single client is interesting, but it's when you get multiple client devices and multiple APs that it gets really interesting. And the, the core way to make Wi-Fi faster is to get everybody to talk faster. But that's because we need to, to free up the airtime to do that. So if you go from this to this, that's a big step. Now all of a sudden, few of you, less of you are contending at one time, the anarchy goes down, it's calmed down a lot, and you go faster. But there's no way, there's no simple way in Wi-Fi to just say, hey, let's all talk faster. In fact, it's not even synchronous. Let's say I'm talking to Marcus, and Marcus is way smarter than me. So he can talk a lot faster to me and I may talk slower to him. So APs and clients actually, uh, it would actually be quite rare for them to have synchronous data rates. I could talk to you at, at 100 megabits per second and maybe you talk back to me at 450. And that's normal and that's actually okay. But the goal is to make everybody talk faster, that way we can get more people. That way we get more total traffic moving on the network. And while that may simply seem somewhat easy, it's actually quite difficult to do. Now these different data rates come from different modulation styles. How many of you are familiar with modulation encoding? A few, okay. So here's the simple example. A waveform, a carrier wave going through the air, I, in my early days of Wi-Fi was how does that wave carry data? And I'm by far not the expert on this, but I can explain it where I understand. And that is, imagine a, a map. And let's say this is a let's say this is a two-bit map. So we have this. This corner equals zero, zero, this is zero, one, one, zero, and one, one. So your job, I'm gonna pick on somebody here. Josh, you're yes. right if I pick on you, man? Yep. Alright, you ever shot a bow and arrow? Yep. Okay. So Josh, your job is you're gonna communicate to me from a distance, and your job is you need to hit this target. Okay? okay? And so you want to send me a one zero, you have to hit this quadrant. You think you could do it? Yes. Okay, I think you could. You seem like a skilled person. <laughs> and so he can communicate that way. So what a wave does is this wave that goes through the air, effectively the best word I can use is lands on one of these quadrants. And you get to send data that way. And then this, there's many ways to do this. This is just one of them. This, Josh did not have to be all that accurate to do this. Right? You had to hit one corner of my quadrant here. How could we send more data? Let's say we want to increase our speed in Wi-Fi, go up the data rate chain. What could we do to this chart? Make the grids a lot more, or a lot smaller. Make the grids smaller. Make the targets smaller. So let's do that. Let's do <coughs> this. So this is now 16, right? Instead of four targets, now I have 16. This has a name called 16 QAM, Quadrature Amplitude Modulation, which is it's used to impress the ladies, but other than that, you don't need to know that. Quadrature <laughs> or quadratic? Uh, quadrature. Quadrature. So, so 16 QAM, we have 16 different target points here. So now, Josh, anybody else use bow and arrow? Anybody yeah. else do it? Okay, Colin, let me, let's see. You, you're all right with it? I used to compete. Oh, great. So, so I'm, I'm glad that you're good at that. Here's the great thing. The transmitter 
for all intents and purposes, is perfect. You shooting the arrow, those of you that have ever shot a bow and arrow, you are perfect at it when you do it. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> but we're, this, this, in the, the Wi-Fi world, there's a little bit of an assumption, from my perspective, that when you transmit, you're perfect. Yeah. But what can mess up your arrow going through the air? Wind. Breathing. Breathing? Pull. Okay. Wind. Wind. That's what I'm looking for. What can happen going through the air? What affects your arrow? Wind. What else? Does gravity affect it? Yes. You guys have gravity? I have gravity in my place. Honestly, <laughs> mostly it's actually the center that screws up during archery. <laughs> yeah, during archery it's the head in the center. Cool. <laughs> but you're going to mess up my analogy if you keep uh, <laughs> saying that. So, okay, quit being right, right, Colin. <laughs> okay. So, so, so the wind, the gravity, the humidity, you know, all these things affect where the arrow lands. And in the Wi-Fi world, we call that interference and noise. Did you know this? I, was, I, I fancy myself smart once in a while, so I watched the MIT open courseware. Anybody ever do that? Because I want to be like Sandiff. And I watched it, and I didn't under, understand anything the guy said. It was like, you know, digital communication 101. But the one thing the professor said that made me just, it, it clicked the light for me. He said, if there was a perfectly noiseless environment, you could transmit an infinite amount of data. Because you could basically modulate to the nth degree, and nothing would ever affect it. It would be perfect. But there's natural noise. There's no way to get rid of noise. Whether you're in space or in the middle of the earth or underground, there's always noise. So, so when you increase, going back to the target, you have all these things that can affect it. We call that, again, noise and interference. Now, let's say that, that you're, you're targeting perfectly. Colin is sending that arrow perfectly but it's not hitting the target. What would happen here? What happens, what happens if you miss your target? By the way, this being four bits now, he goes triple quad zero to one, 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 which by the way is not in order. It's actually spread out in here. But now we're sending more data, right? If you hit the target, or at least within some error uh, difference, you hit that target, you agree we're sending more data. That takes smiley face, actually. <laughs> You're actually sending more data. Agreed? Mm -hmm. sure. So again, we we at how what can what can you do, Colin? If you're a perfect transmitter, what can you do? You can compensate for the wind. You can comp compensate. You can't though. So so in my analogy, here's the problem, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of companies that really talk a lot about spectrum analysis, right? Yeah. The thing is, is that I can never know exactly what's happening at your place instantaneously. If I knew the interference at Ethan's place, I could probably do something cool to fix it. You can measure and adjust. Right, but in a nanosecond world, we can't. Number one, Ethan can't tell me what's going on because that takes a packet to do it. Mm -hmm. so, so what any company can do is we can't adjust for, for the interference at his place. Well, what can we adjust to make it work that target hits better? In a bow and arrow world, what can you do? Without changing your target, what can you do to make sure it gets Get better? Closer. Get closer. I love it. That's great. What else? Improve your bow. I'm sorry? Improve your bow. Greater pull. Greater, Greater pull. Greater poundage. It's stronger, right? It's transmit speed. Right. If it goes through at a high, at faster, it's going to cut through that interference, right? What about if you had a heavier arrow? Right? So all these things increase that signal hitting its target. Well, that's what we do. When we get to our technology piece, that's what we do, is we try to make sure more than anybody else, that that, when we transmit, that that signal hits that target. And you can't do that. We can't do that predictively, right? I can't adjust for interference. I just have to make sure the signal gets there. A, a lot of people that know about ruckus at all knows that we have really good range. That was not the intent of our technology, actually. <clears throat> Even our sales guys really talk about it, and it sells a lot of boxes. That wasn't the intent. The intent of having this more signal thing that you'll t see that we do is to hit the target better. Because as things get more and more complicated, I'm showing you 16, 802.11n goes up to 64 quam. So imagine 16 points in every quadrant. And then something Sandip is going to talk about is something called 256 quam. Imagine there's now 64 of these. What are your chances of hitting that target? You've got to be really close. You've got to have great signal. So these targets get harder and harder to hit. 
you know, and as you, as, you know, there's limits to how well this can work. So that's, um, that is, is important to us. I think if I were to break down our story and what we do, it's hitting this target better with less errors. We listen better. And then our goal is to get those higher data rates in places where it's harder to do. And does it make sense how when we do that, when I can do that for one client and I do it for a group of clients, that that makes everybody faster? Any questions? Okay. So what does Ruckus do to improve this? One of the things that we are probably most known for is our antenna technology. Now, in uh, anything unlicensed, we have limits of how much we can transmit, just like everybody else. In the United States, it's four watts at 2.4 gigahertz. That's the maximum amount of transmission. So would you agree that we're all equal? Me, us, and Cisco, and Linksys, and everybody, we're equal. Well, we are equal in how much we can transmit. So if Ruckus is really the company that we are, we're saying signal is really important, why hasn't everybody just really just maxed out their transmitter to the maximum? Why not? Because it creates extra noise. No, it's legal. I mean, to four watts. Let's say they hit FCC maximum. It's the same FCC. thing that happens if you have a, a hundred watt or a ten watt stereo and you play it all the way at full volume. Everything is noisy and you get artifacts and sound and everything like that. Yeah. Number one, there is a limit to that, and you, you create huge cells, and you've got like lots and lots of different client influence if you turn it all the way up. And right. It. You turn that thing up to 11, you're going to have some issues. And, and a lot of it is maybe you're covering too much area. But um, so what's the, we talked about Bluetooth. Uh, Pete talked about Bluetooth earlier. But what do you think is the worst source of interference in a Wi-Fi network? The microwave, microwave oven. Reflections. <laughs> Ask Jennifer <laughs> Huber and she'll say security cameras. Security cameras? Okay. Anybody else? <laughs> Wi-Fi itself. I had this epiphany one day. I'm like, you know, microwave ovens are bad, Bluetooth is bad, but the biggest source of interference as a consultant, when I was a Wi-Fi consultant, I went in there, I did spectrum analysis, but you know the number one thing I had to fix was Wi-Fi screwing with itself. That's what I had to fix more often than the mic, you know, telling them to get a better microwave oven that doesn't leak and nuke small people. So, so that's the thing that makes the difference. So, so more signal without control is bad. More signal, again, without control, is a negative thing in a Wi-Fi network. So what we do is this is an example of one of our products. We probably have two dozen of these in production, antenna, different antenna designs. This is actually one of our older products, but it actually shows the antenna quite well. So we're going to pass these around. And what I want you to notice is, is what we do is we have three wires for 2.4 gigahertz and three wires for five gigahertz. This is a dual band access point. And they come up just like a normal AP. But it goes to this array. And this antenna array's job is to control signal. So feel free to take pictures of that as well. If you want to take a picture, a great one to, to take of is if you look really hard on the board, you'll see right up here it says get her done. That's uh, Victor Strom. He's one of those crazy PhD types that long hair, rock band, ultra smart guy. He's very attractive. Don't stream that, but yeah. <laughs> um, too late. <laughs> maybe too late. It's real time, I think. So, so what is the goal? What traditionally is done, if you have your AP in the center, what traditionally is done in a Wi-Fi network is they have omnidirectional antennas. And omnidirectional is not evil. It's just an antenna that sticks up like that. And the signal goes 360 degrees around it. Why does it go all the way around it? <coughs> Even if you're the only client, Greg, you're the only client connected, why does the signal go all directions? Because the antenna <coughs> radiates it in an omnidirectional spheroid. Yeah, the, but why did, why did the manufacturers choose to do this? Because they, they can't what, tell where you're going to be. Right, they don't know where you're going to be. They don't know where you are in relation to the AP. They don't know which way the AP is oriented. Right, they don't even know what the AP is going to be. Down, upside down, down sideways, down. on the wall. So normal is omnidirectional. What Ruckus does, that array is like a dynamic directional antenna. How many of you used a directional antenna to steal internet? 
<laughs> can tennis, right? That's what you do, right? I mean, I mean, hypothetically speaking, if you need to get internet somewhere, you can use a really highly directional antenna. That sends more signal one direction and less others. What you're holding as you pass this around is a dynamic version of this. This antenna array has 19 elements on it. And at any time, the software can select any combination of those, of those elements in order to get the signal to John. Right? We need to transmit to John. We're going to create a signal for you. And that signal for you may look like this. So we may send a signal that looks something like that. And if we put that AP in the middle, it would cover all of us. Every time, remember Wi-Fi is this half duplex thing. We don't transmit to everybody at once like these fancy switches you guys deal with. Right? We transmit one at a time because we're Wi-Fi. So when I do that, the next packet out may be going to Terry, and it's going to have a custom signal for you. Now, the difference is, is let's say we have, Pete, is that your iPad? Oh, no, that's yours, Colin. Can I have it? If you want, sure. Permanently? No. Oh, <laughs> can I have it temporarily? Yeah, sure. Right, so, so Colin's iPad here, um, his iPad, he had it laying down, and he may use it laying down, but there's times he may use it standing up. He may use it even crazy like sideways. Those are the other components that I don't have tons of time for today, but, but something called antenna polarization. When you look at that antenna, you'll notice that there are elements that are sideways, horizontal, and vertical. The reason for that is because old Wi-Fi was laptops, right? Everybody in here is using a laptop right now. That's most convenient. Your antennas, for the most part, are in here. They're vertical, so we're going to put our antennas vertical on our APs, and that was a good install. That's when you know, I did it right. But today, you're using your stuff sideways, and we're using you know, our phones are going different orientation, and our antennas are changing polarization with respect to the AP at that time. So you have to be able to not only transmit, but receive on these different polarizations. We call that polarization diversity. So that combination of the ability to transmit one direction. Now, this transmitting of one direction gets more signal to Tom. <coughs> but the bigger and lesser spoken advantage of that within our product is where we're not talking. I said I'm running out of uh, board space here, <laughs> and I'm running out of erasers. It's because your whiteboard markers is the size of Coke cans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll be hating on them, man. I love them. I stole these fair and square from the Santa Clara Marriott. <laughs> we wonder where those came from. I actually have my own set. You guys, I import these from Japan. So they're, uh, I can't pronounce the name. You guys should get these. These are nice too. Love whiteboards. So, what was I talking about? Um, where you're not transmitting. Perfect. So, let's say you have multiple access points. How much time do I have, Marcus? You got the schedule there, right? I like it you make that up. Okay. <laughs> so, so the problem is, is, is channelization, which Sandip is going to talk more about. Um, let's just talk about the 2.4 gigahertz here. You read a good book on Wi-Fi design. You read Marcus's book, and it says, space your channels as best you can. And you say, yes, I'm going to have channel one here and channel one here. This is going to go quick here. But you get this overlap. Why? Because you read it in the book and you did it right. You overlap your cells so you can roam and all this fancy stuff that Wi-Fi needs to do. But imagine you have client devices in this area. These are connected here, maybe two are here, two are here, or 20 and 20. What you end up with is a bunch of Wi-Fi clients on the same channel talking to two different APs. I actually call this, uh, uh, there's something called the hidden node problem in Wi-Fi. I should call this the hidden AP problem. These two APs are hidden from each other. And why? Because it's good design. It's proper design for them to hide from each other. And you have these clients that are connected in a middle spot. But look, so what happens is it increases what's called a contention domain. There's more devices contending for this medium, and bad things happen. So what do we do differently? We send a signal. Maybe, remember, there's clients over here as well around the APs is that when we control the signal, even for a small amount of time, that, that, what, 25 microseconds of time that we sent that packet, we are not transmitting here. So the fact that we control the signal 
is just as important as the extra signal that we gain. In fact, uh, our competitors have said, well, ruckus is technology. You know, the extra signal is bad and high density. Two thumbs up, you're right. That isn't what I'm trying to sell people on. The control is what's important. The fact that we're sending it one direction, more signal or less, I'm not going to argue with. But the fact that it's controlled is important. Because for that moment in time, I'm just talking to Terry, and you guys I'm not going to bother. Right? I, you can have your own separate conversation for that moment in time. That sounds a whole lot better than the story from a predator who claims that when you do, you can, they avoid per channel interference, but the way they do that is by making the clients shut up for a period of time. Right, so I know that competitor. I know who you're talking about. They use CTS frames to do that. Um, the problem with, I know, the reason they do that is technical reason. Um, but it doesn't, all it does is make crashes happen fewer times. Right, it, it makes, so if you're all on one big channel, let's say, hypothetically, you're gonna have, they're making where you have collisions less often. Well, my solution is let's use multiple channels. And well, if you don't get to speak one, to, uh, if you only get to speak one tenth of the time because you're ordered to shut up the other nine tenths of the time, you're getting less throughput. Yeah, right, it would be, it would be excuse the example, but if I said, please don't ask a question mm -hmm. again, you know, yes, I'm making these guys ask, get time for a question, but that's really mean to you. So By the way, I would uh, ask questions. So great. Yes, sir. So this just, it dawns on me that this sounds like when, when you teach switching and you talk micro segmentation and the benefit, right? That's mm -hmm. what it sounds like that, but in the hair. I, mean, uh, I, I, I would, we're going to quote you on that. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> not really. I'll take your permission. Um, I don't like to compare. Ethernet switching, you know, a lot of uh, companies do that, switching in the air and all that. No, it's still Wi-Fi and it still sucks because it's yeah. still contentious. But um, if you think about narrowing the signal, right, if Ruckus could do it, if, if they gave Victor Strom an AP the size of his table, the guy could probably shoot lasers at people, <laughs> right, if he was given enough antenna space. But imagine you can control the signal more and more and more to one client. How would that sound to you? Like phase rear radar. Or like a wire. Yeah. Right? That's what a wire does. A wire controls the medium from point A to point B. Ideally, in an RF environment, we would love to be able to do that. Physics dictate we can't yet, uh, but we would love to. What we're doing is we're trying to get closer to that. That if I can avoid the 80% and hit the 20%, I really want to just hit you, but if it's just the 20%, that's, we'll take that. Because that is an improvement over what we would have normally. 